Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I don't remember. So, uh, this is your fault. And no, I don't just mean those of you who follow this series, I mean the you as in society at large, because you're the ones who have enabled the silent majority dominance of Drake to a point where discerning audiences might realize he's just going through the motions. But how much does anyone care? It's popular beyond adequate measure, and moreover, Drake has mastered the ability to provide consistency and has manipulated his relationships with streaming services to ensure the playlists are well-stocked to deliver it while not appearing to be inorganic. It's Amazon, it's Walmart, it's art as product in its most flagrant way, and while I've seen a lot of music critics wring their hands about chart integrity and what really counts as a hit, the truth is that Drake is working with the bounds of this broken system and Billboard has no problems enabling him. So maybe it's a much bigger question about the society that enables this to keep happening or define what a real hit even is. And I would be remiss not to mention that so much of this is dependent upon subjective appeal. And I have been more forgiving about album bombs if I've liked the music more. But this seems like it's a different thing. Not the active listening, this is the best thing ever that you get from the diehard stands. Although those do exist for Drake and they've kind of been a little lukewarm on this album, but it's more the tolerance of passive listening, the it's good enough, I don't care enough to change the song. In other words, a lot like where the majority of audiences engage with radio, complete with the old-fashioned payola to ensure the streaming playlist placement, except it's just for one artist who has have enough stylistic variety to fill every placement. I guess the more things change... I guess we should all be grateful Radio Proper hasn't gotten on board with all this. And yet there's a part of me that thinks it's just a matter of time. And I bring all this up because looking at our top 10, there is extremely little to say. Drake broke records by grabbing 9 of the 10 slots, almost entirely driven off of his streaming, which means that they likely won't last at the very top, but given how I'm not hearing what's flooding in to challenge him, this will probably last longer than many people will want. This was a thing with Scorpion back in 2018 too. His albums actually have a pretty long radius to dissipate over time. But if we want to rattle through the list here. Way Too Sexy with Future and Young Thug at number one. Congrats to Future for getting his first number one. Girls Want Girls with Lil Baby at number two. Fair Trade with Travis Scott at number three. Champagne Poetry at number four. Knife Talk with 21 Savage and Project Pat at number five. Congrats to Project Pat for his highest charting single. And then Stay by Kid Leroy and Justin Bieber holds on just enough courtesy of his strength across the board to get to number six. Honestly, I would have preferred that Drake replace him too. Then from there, it's In the Bible with Lil Durk and Giveon at number 7, Poppy's Home at number 8, TSU at number 9, and Love All with Jay-Z at number 10. But now we get to the real quandary. Our losers and dropouts this week. I mean, in the latter category, it's surprisingly light. Kanye's album bomb did a lot of work there last week, and most of what we got here is swept aside were his debuts, alongside songs that clinched their year-end list spots like Heartbreak Anniversary by Giveon and Forever After All by Luke Combs, along with tracks that'll fall short like Come Through by Her featuring Chris Brown, Brutal from Olivia Rodrigo, and AM by Neo Garcia, Bad Bunny, and J Balvin. But here's the issue. Nearly half the Hot 100 are losers this week, and I really just don't want to rattle through another clump of names, especially when the songs that didn't move that much are more interesting me that they actually survived. So you know what, I'm actually going to focus on them, most of which are holding on to some vestige of stability pretty low on the charts. Now I already mentioned Stay at number 6, but courtesy of Radio and Sales, we also saw Beggin by Mainskin at 39, and Leave Before You Love Me by Marshmello and the Jonas Brothers cling to 40. Then holding up some of the momentum, we got Happier Than Ever by Billie Eilish at 42, Pippis by Faruko at 45, A-OK -okay by Ty Verdes at 60, Wakisha by Moneybag Yo stabilizing at 62, which is also true for A Whole Lot of Money by Bia and Nicki Minaj at 68, and Love Again by Dua Lipa at 69. Nice. Now there's also a few others. Toto de Ti by Raul Alejandro at 73. Vulvi by Aventura and Bad Bunny at 77. Woman, Get Into It Ya yeah, and Ain't Shit by Doja Cat at 80, 88, and 97 respectively. Guy Alice by Capella Gray at 82. Don't Go Yet by Camila Cabello at 93. And Baddest by Young Blue, Chris Brown, and 2 Chains at 100. But you know, the one thing that tends to remain stable during the streaming album bombs 
Nashville Radio. So here's the country songs that held their own. If I Didn't Love You by Jason Aldean and Carrie Underwood at 43. Things a Man Ought to Know by Lainey Wilson at 51. Country Again by Thomas Redd at 52. Chasing After You by Ryan Hurd and Maren Morris at 53. Cold Beer Calling My Name by Jameson Rogers and Luke Combs at 56. I Was on a Boat That Day by Old Dominion actually going up to 61. Memory I Don't Mess With with Lee Bryce at 70. Cold As You by Luke Combs at 76. Drunk and I Don't Wanna Go Home by L. King and Miranda Lambert at 79. Shocked This Is The Week The Song Has Stability. My Boy by L.V. Shane at 89. Single Saturday Night by Cole Swindell at 90. You Should Probably Leave by Chris Stapleton at 92. And Thinking About You by Dustin Lynch and Laura Elena or Mackenzie Porter at 94. Hell, that countryside even translated to our two gains this week. You Time by Scotty McCrary up to 72. And By Dirt by Jordan Davis featuring Luke Bryan at 74. The rest of the songs on the Hot 100... They're losers, or they're new arrivals. And this is where I have to re-examine my album bomb rules. Where I actually went back when I checked, and my original plan back with the, the Carter 5 album bomb was only focused on the best, the worst, and the songs that landed in the top 10. And given that we got nine new Drake songs just there this week, That'd have been a fair bet, especially as Drake's entire album debuted in the top 40. And again, I've already reviewed the album, and there's not really that much to say for a lot of these songs, and it's going to be a headache to edit regardless. But you know what? I'm actually going to stick to my own rules. I'm going to work to keep this as pithy and short as possible and just cover all of it. If he's going to play his game... I think the gloves are going to come off when I actually play mine. But you know, we're not actually starting the new arrivals with Drake, funnily enough. Number 87, Blue Notes 2 by Meek Mill featuring Lil Uzi Vert. I wouldn't be opposition if they know me. I made a proposition to my hitters. I told them knock down if you owe me. How does the side round hit him? Good and we move him. Got pounds in them 40s. Only Meek Mill would do this. Throw out a song to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Drake and what would be a Herculean task to break through? And he actually did. Although I'd probably put more credit on the Uzi feature as per usual. I do find it very funny that Meek's first line is him saying that he's not in competition with his homies, even if a lot of the veiled references throughout the verse make me think there's probably more lingering tension than I think will go realized. But truth be told, I actually kind of think Meek Mill kills this song. His flows are much sharper, a little bit more focused. He can ride the original liquid guitar rollick and trap beat pretty effectively. And while the framing of his hustle can feel a little undercooked, also as per usual, when he references his time in jail and his desperate struggle to get free and get close to being back on top, there's a sense of real stakes that I'll admit Uzi kind of undercuts with his by the numbers flexing, but not that much. And really, I don't think it helps that Uzi's contributions feel tacked on on and not delivered with anything close to the same intensity Meek has, and the song doesn't really have a hook, but otherwise, hell, I like it more than the first Blue Notes. I'll give him that. This is pretty good. Number 35, The Remorse by Drake. The CDs and the bubble wrap. People recognize me from the TV, but I'm done with that. People don't want to see me succeed. They should come with that. Even when I come back, I don't know if it's me that's going to be coming back. Yeah, it's just Drake from here on out. If y'all want to clear out, I understand. But we're starting off with the album Closer, where Drake flips the chipmunk vocals of Anthony Hamilton against a lumbering tale of his come-up and his inability to properly repay his friends. So much so that he feels like Bernie Sanders when he's tried to distribute money. And yet on a song where he says that everyone else's music is watered down, I don't think there's a stronger argument for taxing the uber-rich than this brand of condescending faux remorse. I initially kind of liked this. It gets worse with every listen. Number 32. Two, fucking fans by Drake. You probably still be there if I came home. Love you like I treat you. You still be there, my girl. Ah yes, the badly produced deep cut featuring Party Next Door Uncredited, which features more of the tired Rihanna concern trolling between the lines where he admits to shamelessly fucking fans. That doesn't make her look crazy when she finds out Drake, it makes you look pathetic. And I stand by the fact Rihanna should slap you. Number 27, Get Along Better by Drake featuring Ty Dolla Sign. Wrong, I know. 
Yeah, the waltz cadence with the organ and the vocals from Ty Dolla Sign, they're fine. The rest of the song features some really inconsistent vocal production, some flubbed high notes, and Drake trying to pull a no hard feelings to an ex, where he now gets along better with her friend. Probably undercut by some of the petty pot shots in each verse, but go figure. Number 26, Fountains by Drake featuring Thames. So this is more of Tem's song than Drake's, and while I'm sure she's grateful for the cosine on this blubbery slice of Afrobeat, I've also been around long enough to hear Drake hop on the hot new sound, a guaranteed crossover before, especially when he's so obviously phoning it in. So I'm not really a fan. Number 25, You Only Live Twice by Drake featuring Lil Wayne and Rick Ross. Yeah, they plotting on me, but they gotta do something. Told my dog to something just to shoot something. This was actually intended as the sequel to The Motto, and in that spirit it sounds absolutely nothing like The Motto, and Rick Ross and especially Lil Wayne really go off on their verses. Drake meanwhile uses his verse to make Chris Brown references and takes shots at Swiss Beats using an Alicia Keys reference. I'm starting to think she should slap you too. Number 24, Yebba's Heartbreak by Drake and Yebba. In the grand tradition of Drake putting an artist on, the majority of the album gets overshadowed by a piano-driven soulful interlude that doesn't even feature his vocals. I mean, outside of the album context, it's decent enough, but within the context, it frames the women as head over heels for Drake's shtick, and that actively tests my patience. Gotta say. Number 22, I Miss You Too by Drake featuring Kid Cudi. Lie, lie. I'm the one she lie, lie. She check it for me. Okay, there's no excuse for the vocals to be this compressed and clumsily blended when the vibe is trying to be this hazy and blissful, and including vocals from Juice World to set things off, it feels cheap. Also, Drake trying to pair his magnanimous attempts to win a girl back on a victory lap, and then take pot shots at those who are jealous about his commercial success who just want to get even. I mean, alongside everything else you say on this album, yeah, even if you reconcile things with Kid Cudi, this is a push at best. Number 18, Race My Mind by Drake. I got the keys. Please. For me. Okay, how is your vocal production this consistently messy across the album, even within the song? Is it because half of these songs leaked months, if not years ago, and you just have to repackage the roughs? Also, even if the keys sound kind of pretty, the drums sound like shit, and Drake negging this girl, even as he says he doesn't care what people say about him, proves that he cares way too much about people racing his mind. Amusing when you consider just how many would run laps around him just off of this. Number 16, 7 a.m. on Bridal Path by Drake. Speak to me, I'm not with all the secrecy, secretly beefing me behind closed doors, but playing it peacefully for the streets to see my nigga have some decency. No joke, when I was going through New Arrivals, I legit forgot this existed. Not a good sign when one of the Drake's Time on Location songs inspires that response. But then I re-listened to it and I'm like, oh right, this is the one where the production's actually pretty decent, but Drake has to try too hard to get his Giannis bar off and then drops a homophobic slur in Spanish, and his own flows feel increasingly awkward as he's trying to punch back at Pusha T and Kanye, and then claim that he never lied about anything in his songs, and doesn't name drop a few bars before referencing LeBron. Braun, and once again, he's not landing a single punch here. Oh, and then I remember exactly why I forgot about this one again. For good reason. Number 14, Pipe Down by Drake. How much I gotta spend for you to pipe down? How deep I gotta dig for you to pipe down? All the things I've done up until right now. I need a thousand pages just to write it down. Okay, this is Drake looking to make Child's Play Part 2, with a chipmunk sample that actively grinds my gears, and Drake trying to tell this girl to shut up because she's not ride or die enough for him, because he's on her ass like back pockets. I mean, at this point, I don't even care who this is about, just whoever it is ensures Drake experiences the subtle joys of sounding. Because this is fucking terrible. Number 12, In Too Deep by Drake featuring Future. Things that a man like me does Outside of the things that would cause you to judge 
All right, points for that guitar line and a pretty cool switch into the darker vibe that comes to trying to get a girl to hook up, but who's actively throwing his own lines back in his face. Kind of makes me wish The Weeknd contributed more than just uncredited backing vocals before the song drops into a washed out, what a time to be alive reject with Future, because there's somewhat potential conceptually. I mean, it's pretty much the only time the intended satire from Drake actually has some teeth. Ergo, yeah, it's okay. I can tolerate this. Number 11, No New Friends in the Industry by Drake. Niggas ain't no kidding me a fact. Whoa, I was known for snapping when I chat before the app. Stood on everything I said and never took it back. Whoa. All right, I can recognize when somebody rewrites their own song at the last minute, where this is basically the flow from energy, but with fewer quotables and rougher production, where we get him complaining about Kanye and Pusha T and No Friends in the Industry, despite being on an album full of said friends. And no, Drake, you're not remotely prepared to die behind the verses because every shot here is bloodless, limp, and you would have died three years ago. The open question is whether or not we would have been better off for it. Number 10, The Love All by Drake featuring Jay-Z. Niggas turn their back on me for no good reason. Loyalty is priceless and it's all I need. Yeah, okay, Drake got the better Jay-Z verse, tacked on after this song leaked last year, mostly where he takes shots at his former business associates and actually seems pretty engaged, I'll give Jay-Z that. Shame Drake mostly wastes it with complaining and subliminals that have nothing close to the same impact, which might match with the dreary sample in the production, but it's got none of the energy. Also, Jay-Z calls out folks beefing online as a poor way to move in the streets. You'd think Drake would have taken notes. Number nine, TSU by Drake. She used to dance, but she went alone and start up a business. Her daddy is not around, her mama is not around. I watch her climb on the top of the pole and then get to sliding down. Look, I don't believe for a second that 40 and Drake's crew didn't know they were sampling R. Kelly here. You have to get clearances. You gotta send royalties. We're not stupid. Instead, we get the chalky percussion where Drake piles on a lot of wealth to support this girl, with supposedly only the lightest strings attached after the beat shifts, and the vocal production gets audibly worse. And why does this have this undercurrent of secretive ickiness that I can't shake? Because it may have had potential, but... Ugh. Number eight, Poppy's Home by Drake. I need to stop. I'm standing at the top. That's how I know you never seen the top. Sierra Kane parking lot, looking like Magic City parking lot. Hear the talks when I walk by, like you know it's over when he talk. Now, this is the song where Drake and an uncredited Nicki Minaj address all the artists who are biting their style against an oppressively annoying chipmunk sample. And you can just tell Drake thinks this whole Barney Stinson routine is funny as all hell, especially with that line about the girls in the bathroom doing something that's not Pepsi, and that mass text line. But you know what? I can't be the only one where it doesn't quite swivel around to being actually charming, even if he is taking the piss here. I mean, I I'm not sure you've got room to stand on dissing pop features with your string of verses for Rihanna and The Weeknd either, but in reality, it does feel like a parody of what Drake's done in the past. That's not a compliment. Number seven, In the Bible by Drake featuring Lil Durk and Giveon. Things just start to pop. Judge me how you judge me. Take them bitches out of trap. Fuck the honey niggas. How them niggas lay you now? Here's a fun question. Why didn't Drake just give the full song to Giveon, who is at least trying to add some balance to the storytelling? And why did Drake's vocals sound so grainy against this more spacious production? And how the hell does he think he can get away with calling this girl a hypocrite, given this album and his career? And why do I think at least some of this is a veiled sub at Kanye due to the Bible reference? And why doesn't any of this work? Number five, Knife Talk by Drake featuring 21 Savage and Project Pat. No capa, street nigga, not a rapper. Chopper hit him and he turned into a booty clapper. Okay, I actually like this too, but that's because it's an obvious leftover from Savage Mode 2, thanks to Metro Boomin's more refined production and a more direct and focused murderous impulse. I mean, it's not great by any means. You can tell by the lack of a truly driving hook that it kept this off Savage Mode 2. But if you're looking for a track off this disaster on this album that actually delivers some real menace, I'll take it. Number four, Champagne Poetry by Drake. Phase trust worse has been done. Man, fuck evaluation, show me personal funds. 
It's the pretty boys versus the petty boys. Sold that already, got a whole new set of toys. Ah, the album opener, where the chipmunk sample drags and Drake meanders through his effortless flows and getting some criticism in Toronto given some of his optics missteps, which is kind of odd. You think he'd be on top of that. But really, this is a victory lap where he's now demanding proper compensation and where he finds a new part of himself to explore, where having this album feels like he started at his navel and then went no further. I mean, clearly that's worth popping the champagne. Number three, Fair Trade by Drake featuring Travis Scott. Seaside, I've been losing friends and finding peace. But honestly, that sound like a fair trade to me. Oh God, leave Charlotte Day Wilson away from your bullshit, Drake. Especially when you make your clanking warble complaints about how nobody can properly catch you, but you're losing friends along the way. All in a song where you have Travis Scott dropping the same dazed hedonism as usual. He's one of your friends in the industry. Yeah, Travis's verse might be better than what he gave Kanye, but opposite the more ominous production that doesn't fit at all with the rest of the vibe of the song, I'm not sure any piece has actually been found. The trade might have fallen through. Number two, Girls Want Girls by Drake featuring Lil Baby. Yeah, say that you a lesbian girl, me too. Hey, girls want girls where I'm from, hey, uh, yeah. Oh look, another song where I wish the guest star had the good sense to avoid this like the plague. But this is the track with the infamous moment where Drake calls himself a lesbian for the hookup amidst some very spare production and one of his laziest hooks to date. And I keep hearing people say, oh, you know, he's just joking around. He's not fetishizing lesbians. And I have four responses to that. Number one, nothing about the song feels all that comedic, especially in the late night vibes the production's trying to set. Two, there's no other jokes in the song beyond the standard flexing. Three, Drake actually had a line about this sort of thing on that god-awful every girl posse cut with Young Money back in 2009. It's not out of character. And four, this is a joke until every douche in a Toronto nightclub tries to pull it off. Because they know... Drake wasn't really kidding about shit. And finally, number one, Way Too Sexy by Drake featuring Future and Young Thug. Too sexy for this ice, too sexy for that jack, yeah, yeah, I'm too sexy for this chain, too sexy for your game. Now I'm more willing to bet that this one's a joke, given the right said Fred sample that Future plays up against that painfully grating synth, but outside of the video there's no coherent punchline in the verses to build off of it because it's the same flex they pull all the damn time, so going over the top doesn't really have much of a meaning. Again, it feels like it's trying to be a parody, look at the video, but not one with any real teeth outside of it. The goofiness that comes from a corporate retreat that's playing to the lowest common denominator. I mean, at least Young Thug tried to flip the script a little bit by ceding some control to the girls' ravenous affections, but just like that last song, it's a joke that I already know guys will want to claim unironically, and it will become insufferable in record time, especially with that synth. If Lil Dicky made this song, y'all would not be so quick to defend it. Just saying. And that's our week. Dear Lord, this was incredibly annoying. And while the worst of the week fall out pretty fast, uh, that's piped down as the worst of the week with fucking fans as a dishonorable mention, the best of the week kind of wind up a little tricky. I'm gonna give Knife Talk with 21 Savage and Project Pat the honorable mention, and the best of the week to In Too Deep with Future, tied with Blue Notes 2 by Meek Mill featuring Lil Uzi Vert. I mean, neither of the songs are all that great, but they at least accomplished what they wanted to do, and Meek Mill did kind of impress me. Next week, the fallout from all this shit, so stay tuned for that. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Balls, and I'll see you.